Central Christian Church. It's great to see everybody. Our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders can head upstairs. I hope uh, that God gave you as many opportunities this week as he gave to me to work on changing my perspective, uh, because I felt like I had a lot of opportunities to change my perspective. And instead of complaining, trying to look at it from a different point of view, um, the, uh, the whole idea of changing our perspective is so that we can point people to God, so we can draw them to God by seeing things differently. So this morning, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my topic to you, and we're going to again talk about controlling our mouth and, and, and the power we have and how we should be using that the right way. And I want to tell you a story of something that happened to me. Uh, this was way back when we first built the building. This is our first couple months here. And so what happened is we had the, this, this brand new building and, and people in the community were really excited about it. And so we would get uh, all sorts of people coming in to check it out and, and excited to be here. And, and it was incredible, incredible to see the growth that God had planned for Central Christian Church uh, in just those first few months. And so that was really exciting. But we also had some other people that saw this church being built, and they saw this church growing, and they assumed that something is not quite right there. You know, they assumed that we must be doing something wrong. We must be, you know, teaching the, the prosperity gospel, or we must be really odd or something like that. And, and, and we are a little odd, but we're not preaching the prosperity. We're just preaching from the Bible, and we love people. You know, it's a really, really simple formula. So um, we, we would get some different types of people that would come in here and, and really just look for something to be critical about, something to tear people apart. And uh, this, this particular day, I had the opportunity to preach. And I was preaching about Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And I remember it because it was, it was a, a, a different story. I wasn't super familiar with the story, so I spent a lot of time studying it and then working to apply it and talking about what happens in our lives when we do things our own way instead of God's way and the consequences from that. And, and then really just trying to like challenge people to look at their lives and to live their life in a way that is following God's commands. Well, I preached this message in... And, and I, have, I have done some weird stuff. Like, I've pulled out a cow tongue on stage. You know, I have had, I've put crazy stuff in a blender and mixed it all up. And, and, you know, so, like, this was a pretty, like, basic sermon. You know, three-point sermon, just, like, pretty, like, pretty, pretty basic. And so uh, I, I go out to stand by the doors as people are leaving just to say bye and, and, and stuff. And there's one lady who I have never seen before in my life. Never seen her before. And she walks up to me. And, uh, and she says, you know, she's like, I, I came here today hoping to hear a really good sermon. And I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be a really, like, nice, like, uplifting conversation. And she paused, and she looked at me, and then that, that like, little smile started turning to, like, a smirk. You know, and then it kind of turned to a scowl. And it was about that point I saw the horns come up and the pitchfork, <laughs> and, uh, and she, you know, she said, you know, I came here today hoping to hear a good sermon. She's like, I guess I'm just going to have to keep looking. And I, it's okay, I got her back. Don't worry. I got her back, all right? So she says that, and I, I'm shocked initially. I'm just shocked. I'm like, wow, like, I thought that was a pretty decent sermon. So the longer I thought about it, the angrier I became and the less appropriate my responses became, all right? So as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I just have to answer. I just got to answer. I had a lot of things I wanted to say, all right? And I don't think this lady realized, like, I'm not your typical preacher. In fact, at that point, I wasn't a preacher. I was the youth minister, all right? The youth ministers have a whole different set of standards than ministers, all right? Like, like, our bar is set a little lower, all right? So I don't think she realized that, you know, that, that I want to be full of grace and love. But sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. And so she says that. She looks at me and she says, you know, I came hoping to hear a really good sermon. And I guess I'm just going to have to keep looking. I, I looked at her and I tried to return the smirk and I said, well... I hope you do keep looking, you know, and, and I just left it there and started talking to the next person 
in line. You know, but I'll, I'll be lying if I said that didn't stick with me. Obviously, I remember it after all these years. And it didn't, you know, it, it got to me a little bit. You know, my, my hands were kind of shaking. I was, like, frustrated. So as people were coming through, I'm, you know, just like, I oh, have a great week. And um, one, of my, one of my friends, you know, she's known me since I was born. She was getting ready to come through. And she says, hey, Andy, you know, that was, I really like that sermon. I really like the way you challenge us to look at our lives and see what little ways we're deviating from what God says. And, and she's like, you know, that, that brought up a couple things in my life that I really need to take care of. Thank you for that. And I thought, wow, what a difference. Like, what a difference between the way we can use our words. We can use it to tear people down, or we can use it to build people up. And so what I want to talk about this morning is how we're using our words. Are we using our words to be overly critical, to tear people down? Because criticism is a problem. Now, I'm not talking about like constructive criticism. I'm not talking about positive feedback or, or even negative feedback that you get like at a work or, or from different situations. What I'm talking about is a type of criticism that is, that is meant to demean it's meant to judge. It's meant to cut people down. It's meant to nitpick every little piece of somebody's life, of what they're doing, until you have ruined that person. It is a, a major problem. And we have to be able to address that and fix that. Now, I know maybe what you're thinking, and, and, and we say this a lot, but you may be sitting there getting ready to like nudge your spouse, make sure they're paying attention, or you may be getting ready to run upstairs, make sure they're recording the sermon so you can send it to your sister-in-law or to your boss or whoever, all right? But this sermon is for the critical person in your life, you, okay? This is for each and every one of us right where we're at because we all fall into that tendency of being really critical, being, being nitpicking about different things. So this sermon really is just for you. It's just for me. It's just for each and every one of us because it's not our job to change our sister-in-law's heart. It's not our job to change our boss's heart. Okay, we control ours with the help of God and we allow God to work in their lives. So this message is for us. Uh, one of the major problems with criticism, just, just going to put this out there, one of the major problems with criticism is that we hate it, but we don't oftentimes notice when we're doing it to other people, do we? One of the reasons is because we feel really justified in what we're saying. You know, we think, well, if, if they weren't so careless with their money, or if, if they weren't so stupid, or they definitely should not wear that outfit because that does not flatter them at all. You know, we think we know what's best in their life. So a lot of times what happens is we say, you know what, like, I know that you have a plan for your life. I know that God has a plan for your life, but hey, I got a plan for your life too, okay? Here's how I want you to live your life. I'm gonna tell you how to live your life. And so what we're really saying is your plan's okay, God's plan is okay, my plan's best, you know? And that's a dangerous place to be. But as a result, it, it puts us in a situation where we are very willing to criticize other people's kids. We're really willing to criticize the way they dress, what they post on Facebook, how they drive, where they go on vacation, what they do on their free time. Um, it is a dangerous trap to fall into. So what I want to do this morning is we're going to start with a very popular verse from the Bible. All right, I, want to take, I want you to take your Bible out or take your phone, use the app. I want, uh, we're going to look at a very popular verse from the Bible that I think probably a lot of people know. Uh, and then we're going to look at the verse that follows that also. Okay, this verse is really popular. Like you'll see it on wall art sometimes or shirts, things like that. But the verse that follows it in Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going. The verse that follows it also gives us some really in, uh, powerful insight on how we're supposed to live our life. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 14. Galatians 5, 14. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. All right, you've probably heard that. The entire law is fulfilled on keeping just this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us have heard that. Most of us probably try to live that way most of the time. It kind of makes us feel good. We're like, you know what? I can do that. I can love my neighbor. I can, I can love that person that, that lives beside me. I can love that person that I see at work that's maybe a little bit different. I, I can do that. But the next verse, verse 15, is a little more, I guess, intense. All right, it says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. 
it, it shows us the power that our words have. It's not just a, hey, if you can do this, if you can love your neighbor, that would be great. It's also showing us that if you don't do that, if you are constantly criticizing and nitpicking and tearing people down, you're going to devour them and you're going to devour yourself at the same time. So if we are constantly critical, if we're always cutting into people, if we're always harsh with our words, not only are we destroying other people, we're destroying ourselves. And if you think about it this way, then aren't we really breaking that command that he talks about in verse 14? I mean, I mean that's what we're doing. We're breaking that command by constantly tearing people apart. And I want you to think about in your life where you're at right now, what if in your marriage, your constant critical words are destroying the potential intimacy in your relationship? What if in, in the way you raise your kids, your critical words are building a wall between you and your children, block by block, word by word, and you never see it coming? What, what if your critical words are actually keeping you from showing the goodness of Jesus Christ, from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because of how critical you are about your drive to work. Is it really worth it? There's a couple other verses that talk about this similar issue, and they're what I like to call contrasting verses. So they'll, they'll take, uh, you know, like, here's one way to do it, here's a better way to do it. Or here's maybe how you heard it was done, but here's how we should be doing it. This is in Proverbs 12, 18. If you want to go ahead and flip there, Proverbs 12, 18. Bless you. Proverbs 12, 18. It says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So there, there's the two sides. We can make a choice. We can make cutting, angry remarks that are like a sword piercing and hurting people. Now, I, 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 what I've noticed is that people today are really good at like passive aggressive remarks, right? Like, pa like just like really being passive aggressive. They'll say like, wow, you actually look nice today. Like, that's kind of a compliment, but it's also kind of a dig, right? Like, okay, so you're inferring that all the other days I don't look good, you know? Like, or like, wow, like you actually look like you lost some weight, like why do you seem so shocked by that? You know, like, it, it, it's like, it's a cutting remark, just dressed up and made to look a little nice, just a little prettier. But, but they pierce the person's soul. The other side of that is the words of the wise bring healing. So we can choose, we can choose to, to hurt and to criticize and to destroy people with our words. Or, we can create healing. If you have your Bible, go to Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29. It says, uh, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Think about the challenge that is being issued there. If every time you open your mouth to speak, and you remove any unwholesome talk, any talk that is not helpful for building others up, any talk that is not benefiting those who are listening, how much would you still be able to talk in your daily life? He says, don't let unhelpful, unwholesome, impure words come out of your mouth. Don't tear people down. Only words that build people up are the words that should be coming out of our mouths. One word, one phrase, one sentence, one interaction can pierce someone's soul and stick with them for years and years and years and cause this sort of damage that we can't even fathom sometimes. But the great news is the contrasting part is one word, one phrase, one sentence, one interaction can bring healing if it's wise. Simply put, our words have an incredible amount of power. Some people make cutting remarks. People who are wise use words that bring healing. For me, in that moment, after I preached that sermon, the first lady that came through, she was a life taker. Like, that's what she wanted to do. 
Because our words have the power to take life and they have the power to give life. My, set, my friend who came through, she gave life. She, she promoted healing. Our words have the power of life and death. So I want to ask you a very simple question. What kind of person do you want to be? Which part of that contrast do you want to be? We're going to look at two options. I want you guys to take out your, uh, your bulletin, if you have one, or you can take a connection card or a piece of paper or something, and, and, and the, open it up, and there's a space in there in the announcements, or you can use the front page here. Um, there's a, a space there that's, that's blank, all right? Um, I, I want you to write down our two options. Okay, the two options that we can choose to be in this afternoon, I want you to pray about it, think about it, and choose the option for you. Now, I'll be quite honest with you. The first option is the easiest option. Like, like it is the path of least resistance. It is definitely the easiest way to go. But as we tell our kids on the football team, if it's easy, it's wrong. All right, this is the easiest option. The first type of person we can be is a fault finder. Go ahead and write that down. Fault finder. Honestly, this is what most people are. This is like our default setting. Fresh out of the box, this is what it's already set to, is a fault finder. Ken talked about some of the reasons that people fall into that attitude of being really critical and finding fault in things. I think one of the main reasons is because of our sin nature, because of, because of what we want, because of, uh, uh, of what we think we deserve. It's really easy to be a fault finder. Like, uh, like it's super easy. It just comes naturally. It just comes super naturally. You can take a really good person and destroy them in an hour if you really want to. I mean, you think, of, think about your relationship maybe with your spouse. Okay, think about like a, a morning that's kind of like hectic and chaotic and you're tired, you didn't get to bed early enough and you wake up and, and your spouse is walking and they're just like walking like heel to toe too loud and it's driving you crazy. And so you say, will you walk quieter? You know, like, come on, you're going to wake everybody up. And then they start eating their breakfast and it's cereal and, and they're chewing really loud and you're like... What? Like, are you trying to chew? Are you mic'd right now? Like, what is going on? And then they, they tell you something and it involves a joke, and you're like, I've heard that joke before. That's not funny. It wasn't funny the first time. It wasn't funny this time. And then, then you're like, you know what? You were snoring last night, too. That's why I'm so tired. We start finding all these faults. And then you're like, you know what? Also, honey, in the morning, you're a mouth breather. Okay, I can hear you breathing from all the way across the house. Stop. Like, if we want to... We find all these faults and we can just tear somebody down in the matter of minutes. We can pierce their soul in the matter of minutes. We can go into the office and we can be fault finders. We can go in and we can say, I don't like the way you're running your meetings. I, I, don't, I don't like your plan. I don't think this is going to work. You don't know what you're doing. I don't like your emails. There's too many of them. Or maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're like me. Okay, maybe you have that one friend on Facebook that you just kind of keep for the drama. You know, just to like, if your life is just like pretty calm, it's a Saturday night, you're sitting at home, nothing good on TV, you're like, ah, let's see what they're up to. Let's see what's going on in their life, all right? Because you know there's going to be some drama on there. And you get on there and you're like, wow. She says she loves Jesus, but I think she loves her body a whole lot more. You know, like, what? I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, if you love Jesus, you don't post that. You know, like, you start, you start looking for the faults in people. Or maybe there's that one family with those kids. You know what I'm talking about? Those kids, all right? Like, I don't know that we have to say a whole lot more. You're around them, and you're like, wow, the way they raise their kids, like, just send them to jail now. Like, man, like, this is... Just save yourself the trouble. Save yourself the money. If they're going to raise their kids that way, just, just take them to jail. You know, it's really easy to be a fault finder, isn't it? It's really easy. The problem is, is the Pharisees were fault finders. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what they were really good at. They were really good at finding the fault in other people. And, and you know what's even scarier than that? Is the devil was a fault finder. He is really good at that. In the Bible, he's listed a lot of different ways. He's listed as the deceiver, the devourer, the prince of darkness, the father of lies. He's also called the accuser. 
He accuses the people before God day in and day out. The devil is a fault finder. He finds fault. The Pharisees, who thought they were better than everybody, they found fault. That's what they like to do. The reality is, is if we're not careful, we fall into that same grouping of being fault finders. There's a lot of reasons. One of those reasons is pride. We think we know what's best for their life. One of the reasons is we're insecure. You know, you see that a lot, especially with like, like middle school, high school age kids are insecure, so they tear other people down to make themselves feel better. One of the uh, reasons is we just don't understand. We can't empathize. We can't relate to their situation. Full disclosure, before I had kids, I thought I was the best parent ever, all right? Like, I, I, had, I had no idea how hard it was to be a parent. And you'd go to the store, and you'd see these parents doing stuff, and you just think, man, they have no idea what they're doing, do they? Like, when I'm a parent, that's never happening. You know, they, if, they, if they start acting like that, I will just snap my fingers, and they'll stop right away. And, you know, and it'll just be cool, calm, and everybody's going to be like, oh, look, there goes the awesome dad. He's really cool. Let me tell you what, that doesn't happen, all right? <laughs> I'm a dad. I took uh, Reagan and Rush, they were 13 months apart. When they were three and two, and you took them to the store, you prepared for battle, all right? <laughs> you were geared up, ready to go. You took snacks, you took everything you could imagine, and guess what? It wasn't enough, all right? <laughs> You'd go to the store, and it's like, I understand why you don't negotiate with terrorists, Okay? Because if you go to the store with little ones, you just realize you just, you just got to give them all their demands and just hope for the best, right? Like, please stop crying. Stop screaming. Why is it so hot in this store? Why is everybody looking at me? Let's go. I don't care if we haven't paid for our groceries. Let's go. It is intense. Before I was a parent, I thought I was the best parent ever. Now I realize that it's hard work. It is incredibly hard work. When we criticize other people, when we look at their lives, we tend to think that, that we're a lot smarter than we are, and that we have all the answers, and that they know nothing. We think we look like an expert. We think we look so smart. In reality, what it does is it makes us look insecure. It makes us look mean-spirited. It makes us look foolish when we're extremely critical of other people. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Really think about this. Have you ever met a super critical person that you've wanted to be like? Have you, have you ever had that role model and you thought, you know, I just love the way they tear people down. That seems really cool. Like, I, I love the way they make everybody feel this big. Have you ever met someone that you wanted to be like that was like that? Have you ever met a super critical person that you've wanted to spend a lot of time with? Maybe you've had to, but have you ever wanted to spend a lot of time with somebody who was really critical? The Bible, the Bible talks about this. I debated whether or not to put this in, um, but I figured, hey, you only live once. Let's do it, all right? So I want you guys to understand that I'm bringing up this verse and it's from the Bible, like the Holy Bible, okay? It's not, it's not me, like I'm just the mouthpiece for what's saying here. So I need a couple things to happen. One, guys, it's in your best interest to just look at me. Don't smile. Don't smirk. Don't move your arm at all. Just freeze. Don't let your heart rate go up. Definitely don't go mm-hmm or amen, okay? Just, just let the Word of God speak, all right? Uh, because again, this is not your place. This is in the Bible. I can already feel some of the heat from the women. Like they're already, they're already like, oh, what's he got? Hey, Proverbs 29, 21, 19. It says this. Some of you guys are looking it up. I like it. It says, it's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. It's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. All right? <laughs> so... There's not a verse in the Bible about what it's like to live with a man, though, is there? If, if God ever, like, decides to let me write a book of the Bible, which he won't, that's heresy, but, you know, he, he's not going to do it. But if he did, it'd be 1 Andrew 12, 25. Uh, it would say something like this. It would say, it's better to get bamboo shoots in your fingernails than to live with a complaining, constantly picking you apart husband. It'd be something like that. Because the reality is, 
nobody wants to spend time with somebody who is just ultra critical, who is a fault finder in every aspect of your life. It goes both ways, doesn't it? Do you want to be a fault finder? That's the first thing we wrote down. Or here's the second one. Do you want to be a hope dealer? Do you want to be a hope dealer? Romans 15, 13. It says this. Romans 15, 13 it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul was the chief hope dealer. Like, like he was just constantly giving people up, uh, hope. If he wrote something, he wasn't tearing people down. He wasn't out to destroy people. He was going to build them up. He wasn't going to let unwholesome talk come out of his mouth. Only the type of talk that was helpful for building and speaking life into other people. If you look through some of his writings, just like I picked Romans chapter 8. If you look through Romans chapter 8, you'll see the hope. You'll hear the hope over and over and over. Romans chapter 8, these are a few of the things it says. Listen to the hope that Paul is writing. He says... In Romans chapter 8, he says, Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those, who are in, for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. That gives me hope. He said, he said this about the Holy Spirit. He said, it helps you in your weakness. That gives me hope. He said, Jesus is making intercession at the right hand of God, the Father, right now for us. That gives me hope. He said that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. That gives me hope. He said that neither death nor life, neither demons nor angels, neither powers of the present or the future, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is hope. So do you want to be a fault finder, which is easy but wrong, or do you want to be a hope dealer? It's going to cost you. You're going to have to work at it. But it's right. The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. Jesus is full of hope. There's a lot of different metaphors for Jesus in the Bible. It says he's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the good shepherd. He is the door. He is the living vine. He is the gate. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the alpha and omega. He is the beginning and end. First Timothy, Jesus is called simply our hope. And in Titus, Jesus is called the blessed hope. In First Peter, Jesus is called the living hope. Because here's what would happen. Whenever someone would sin, the Pharisees would swoop in and they would just find one thing. Fault. They would just find sin. Jesus could come to the same situation and offer hope. He gave hope. When there was a woman caught in adultery, what did the Pharisees do? They swooped in and they focused on what they wanted to do, who they wanted to be, fault finders. And they said, we have to put her to death. We have to stone her. That's what the law says. And they're correct. Jesus comes in to the same situation. And instead of saying, yep, you know what? Let's stone her. He kneels down and he starts writing in the sand. We don't know for sure what he wrote. A lot of scholars tend to think that maybe he was writing the sins of the Pharisee men who were there. I, I, I think that's very possible, but I don't know. But what, what we do know is that one by one, oldest to youngest, these people left while Jesus was riding in the sand. Then what's Jesus do? He kneels down beside this woman, this woman who is broken, this woman who is full of shame, this woman who has been ridiculed, this woman who was thrown out and he says, where are your accusers? Where are those who accuse you? They were all gone. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Don't do this anymore. There is a better way. He says, go your way and don't sin anymore. But you can find forgiveness. You can find life. You can find love. You can have hope. So in our lives, what do we want to be? 
Do we want to be what the Pharisees were? Do we want to be what our spiritual enemy is? The prince of darkness, the father of lies, the great deceiver, the accuser of the brothers, the fault finder. Or do we want to be Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life? He is the living hope. He is our hope. He is our only hope. I want to be a hope dealer. You know, when, when Jill and I uh, found out that we were going to have kids, uh, we were so excited. And I remember uh, sharing the, the news with, with Ken and Mal as we were sitting at McDonald's on uh, Newark Road. You know, that's where you go to share, like, crazy, exciting news, all right? Uh, we, were, we were young and poor, you know, so you just do what you can do. All right, I remember how excited we were. And I remember Mel talking about it. I don't remember her exact words, but I remember her saying, like, with your kids, just constantly tell them who they are. Affirm who they are and what they believe and, and who, how you see them. Because the world's going to tear them down. We have no idea the amount of damage this world can cause to us, to our kids, to our spouse. And simply, like, affirming who our kids are before God changes everything we have a couple options fault finders who look foolish who look critical who look insecure look mean spirited or we choose hope we choose to be a reflection of God in this dark world the Bible says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, my son Rush is not the neatest of kids. Okay? He's an eight-year-old boy. Like, you know, it, it is what it is. We uh, have had to, to work with a lot of that stuff. Like, you know, he gets his homework all done instead of putting it back in his folder nice and neat and then zipping it up and hanging it on the hook by the door. He takes it and he's like... <laughs> And then he throws the entire book back. We're like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you got to get grades on those. You know, like, he's just not a very neat kid. Like, tidy. He's not a very tidy kid. But you know what? He's a very loving kid. He, he cares for people. He cares for people that his friends or people have just completely forgotten. He loves people. So we have made the choice to build him up and talk about what he is. And instead of saying, you know, you don't keep your room very clean. Like, this is disgusting. We'll work with him on it. But then we tell him, you know, Rush, you're amazing. I love what I see in you. I love your heart. I love the way you speak about others. I, I love the way you care for people that other people don't seem to care about. We build them up. Maybe you have a sibling that you live with, a sister or a brother. Maybe you even share a room. Uh, and they take your clothes. They take your stuff. They take your phone charger. All that sort of things. That's what brothers and sisters do. Like, get over it. You know what I mean? That, that, that just comes with the territory. Instead of focusing on that, tell him, you're the best friend I'm ever going to have in life. Like, like, no matter what, 50 years from now, you're going to be my friend. Like, you are loyal. I couldn't imagine not having you as a sibling. Maybe your wife isn't the most organized, but she's an incredible mom. Instead of nitpicking and criticizing her for what she's not, build her up for what she is. I love the way you love our kids. I could never have married anyone that would impact my children more eternally than you. Maybe your husband will never win yard of the month. That's me. Maybe he just doesn't like to mow the yard, but maybe he looks really good doing it. All right? <laughs> Why are we laughing? Uh, you know, he gets, he gets those sandals and those black socks pulled up. And he gets those old shorts that have paint all over them and a cut-off t-shirt, and he just looks really good. Tell him that, all right? Tell him that. We can choose to speak words of life into people, or we can choose to pierce their soul. You know, you might say, you know, Andy, you're, you're really passionate about this, and the reason I'm passionate about it is because I've been there. I've had a really critical spirit. I know that the damage that causes to other people, and I know the damage that it can cause to ourselves. Instead of trying to find what God was doing, I was looking for what wasn't happening. I was looking for how I could do something better. 
And it's amazing how when I was young, I thought I knew everything. And now that I'm older, I do. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what it says. <laughs> now that I'm older, I don't even know what I don't know. You know, like, it, it's incredible. The older I've gotten, the more I realize that I don't know what's going on. I was so critical in my spirit at times because I was really insecure. But the closer I get to God, the more I become aware of my own sinfulness. The closer I get to God, the more I become aware of how much I need God's grace in every aspect of my life. And the more I become aware of just how amazing God is and what he's done for us. And so now, instead of wasting the time criticizing the speck in someone else's eye, I take care of the log sticking out of my own eye because of who God is, because of what he's done, because of how he's forgiven me, because of how he's loved me when I was unlovable, because of how he's given me hope. I choose to build up, not to tear down. So Central Christian Church, it's decision time. It's not our invitation time. It's decision time for each and every one of us. On your paper, you have written down fault finder, hope dealer. Who are we? Who are we? We are people of God. We are hope dealers. We point people to Jesus, the living hope. We point people to Jesus, the King of Kings. We point people to Jesus, the one who heals our brokenness, the one who forgives us of everything we've been through. We point people to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Simply put, we point people to hope. We're not fault finders. It's too easy to be a fault finder. Anybody can be a fault finder. The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. We are followers of Christ. We are hope dealers. So my question for you, what do you want to be? Let's pray. Father, this morning uh, I pray that your spirit is active and does uh, a very um, powerful healing and convicting. Lord, I pray that you heal us of, of, of those things that um, are, are holding us back from being able to, to view others uh, the correct way. Lord, I pray that you convict our hearts uh, help, help us to be different. Help us to not rely on what's easy. Help us to, to, speak, help us to speak life. Help us to, to give hope in every situation. Lord, I pray that for each and every one of us, you help us to not be fault finders, but instead make an active choice to be hope dealers. Lord, I pray that you work on our hearts, and when we fail, encourage us. Remind us of what's at stake. Remind us that, that we cannot and we should not pierce someone else's soul just to make ourselves feel better, to look smarter, or because of our insecurities. Lord, help us to see the power of our words. Help us to change our hearts so that in all circumstances, good or bad, we can point people to you. Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You know, what's really interesting about the devil is, is here's what he does. He takes something that you know is wrong and he has you look at it and he tempts you and he says, you know what, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, it's, it's pretty small. Everyone's doing it. Nobody will care. And so you give in to that sin. You give in to that temptation and you indulge or you take part of that. And then after you've done it, the devil says, what did you do? Don't you realize how big of a deal that is? You really messed up. You're, you're pathetic. God's never going to love you. You're ruined. God can never use you. God can never clean that. God can never make you whole again. He lies to us. He's the fault finder. He lies to us. He tricks us. And then he accuses us. Saying, you're not good enough. You've gone too far. You're too messed up. After what you've done, God couldn't love you. But what the devil doesn't realize is who our God is. He doesn't realize how much our God loves us. He doesn't understand the sacrifice, the love, the grace, the mercy that we have been shown and are being shown. It changes lives. That is our hope. Jesus Christ was the ultimate hope. 
The only chance we have is through Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you are without hope, we want to encourage you to come forward. This morning, if you're living your life separated from God, there is a hope. His name is Jesus Christ. We have to choose Jesus. We have to choose living for him, not for this world, confessing him as our Lord and Savior, being buried to our sins in baptism, rising again for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, that is our hope. That's what gives us hope. So if you have a decision to make, I want to encourage you. Don't wait. Don't wait for the perfect situation. Don't wait till you know everything. Don't wait until your life's great. Do it now. Accept the hope. Accept the gift. Let's stand.